Hollywood, likely that he would commit suicide and miss the first two times. There was no gunpowder residue on his hands, and the guests waited an hour before calling the police after hearing only one single gunshot. Authorities didn't submit any official crime scene photos or check the gun for prints. When pressed, Lemon said that she had accidentally shot a hole through the floor previously, but she could not explain away the second hole in the floor. Whilst the coroner ruled Reeves' death a suicide, many others suspected foul play. Tony Mannix had purchased the property for Reeves, and after his death, struggled for over a decade to rid herself of it. In fact, since his death, it has been bought and resold several times. Each time, a similar account emerged. The ghost of George Reeves had scared them away. The apparent tales of a troubled apparition fueled the rumors of a murder and a restless spirit waiting to be put to rest by the truth. One couple who moved into the house had no issues to begin with. Then one night, they heard the sound of gunshots and were overcome with the smell of gunpowder. This same incident occurred for the next seven nights until they opted to leave the house altogether. Another couple said that Reeves would frequently appear to them in his Superman costume and point at the ceiling. Further inspection would reveal it to be the spot of the bullet hole that killed him. Once again, the apparition drove them from the home. Yet another couple who bought the house moved in and saw an apparition of Reeves in the nude, groaning in agony. Allegedly, they went to a hotel for the night and moved out the very next day. Another chilling occurrence happened when new tenants were entertaining guests one evening. Their soiree was cut short when all of them heard noises coming from upstairs. Naturally, they investigated and followed the sound to Reeves' bedroom. The room was in complete and utter disarray. The bed linens had been torn off the bed and clothes were strewn across the floor. When they returned to the living room, they discovered that all the drinks that they had left on the coffee table had been moved to the kitchen. Later in the evening, their German shepherd inexplicably started barking furiously at the door to the bedroom. When they opened the door, they found the bed had been moved across the room. It wasn't long after that, the couple were visited by the apparition of Reeves, once again in his Superman costume, once again pointing at the ceiling. Enough was enough, and they moved out of the home that same morning. Many former residents claimed to hear gunshots and smell powder, the bedroom in disarray, and even Reeves himself. During a time of trouble when the property was vacant, two sheriffs were called out to watch the Benedict Canyon home because there were so many complaints from neighbors. These reports included people hearing screaming, gunshots, and seeing the lights go on and off in the home all in the middle of the night. These same neighbors also reported seeing Reeves' apparition standing on his front lawn. Even a film crew and actors making a documentary about Reeves in the home also saw him standing in his full Superman attire in his old bedroom. Why? In 1951, Reeves first portrayed Superman in a short film titled Superman and the Mole Men. The movie was the catalyst and soon launched the adventures of Superman a year later until 1958 with Reeves appearing as Superman in 104 episodes. After the series ended, however, fortune took a different turn, and Reeves was having trouble finding quality work as an actor. He was finding it near impossible to shake off the spandex. At 45, he found himself resorting to commercials or celebrity boxing matches. Some believe he spiraled into a deep depression that culminated in his suicide at the home. However, Close friends noted that on the contrary, he had just begun a second career as a promising Hollywood television director. All parties can agree that putting his professional career aside, his personal life certainly could have played a deciding factor in either a murder or a suicide. When he left his lover of several years, Tony Mannix, she reportedly became extremely jealous. This jealousy only increased when she discovered that Reeves had not only dumped her for a younger woman, Lenore Lemon, but also that he intended to marry her. Even though Tony herself was married to a former MGM vice president, her jealousy continued to bubble. Did she reach a point where she was unable to contain such explosive rage? Or could Lemon have pulled the trigger? No one could agree about Reeves' state of mind before his death, or provide an accurate ironclad account of what happened. According to some, Tony Mannix confessed to a priest that she had in fact killed him 
before she died. Could it have been a studio cover-up to protect her or her high-powered husband? Is George another victim to fall foul of the curse? Was he depressed enough to kill himself or had someone else pulled the trigger? Perhaps the curse is simply never being able to be seen as anything other than the Man of Steel. Most importantly, has George's spirit been wrecking havoc for all these years? And if so, will it ever be able to rest? Before the likes of David Copperfield, Penn and Teller, Dynamo, or David Blaine, there was one man whose secrets, even now some 100 years later, have remained exactly that. With an impressive inventory of tricks, many of which have yet to be surpassed, it's no wonder he is referred to frequently as the master of magic, king of illusion, and a sensational escape artist. Born Eric Weiss in 1874 in Budapest, Houdini was a man ahead of his time. Yet magic often has a more simple explanation than what is posed. True in the case of Houdini, whose methods were at worst impressive, more often ingenious. In a cruel twist of fate, the man who exposed the deceptions of the spiritual world, whose tricks and illusions were masquerading as the channeling of ghosts and ghouls, died aged 52 on the 31st October, Halloween. As a result, most believe to be a result of one of his regular stunts going wrong, the initial incident occurred in Houdini's dressing room over a week prior when asked by a spectator whether it was true that punches in the stomach did not hurt him. Houdini offered a casual reply that his stomach could endure a lot. He was then delivered some very hammer-like blows below the belt. Houdini, unprepared as per his usual stage routine, was reclining on a couch at the time, having broken his ankle while performing. The official cause of Houdini's death was listed as peritonitis caused by a ruptured appendix. The real question is whether the punches made him more inclined to ignore the pain and seek out sooner help, or whether the punches caused the appendix to rupture in the first place. Here's where this Halloween tale gets really interesting. Houdini had previously made a pact with his wife, Bess. He promised that if contact from beyond the grave were indeed possible, he would do so. In typical Houdini fashion, he even came up with a code to ensure that no one could ever fake his spirit's appearance. The code word was Rosabelle, followed by the phrase, answer, tell, pray, answer, look, tell, answer, answer, tell, a shorthand used between the two when they had been on stage together. In their code, it spelled believe. Over the years that preceded, thousands held simultaneous seances in an effort to tempt his spirit into conversation. On one occasion it was claimed his ghost was witnessed, in another, it wrote a letter. Thanks to his coded promise, all were refuted to be false, as Bess's requests remained unanswered. For ten long, pre-agreed years, Bess remained devoted to holding this annual event in the hopes her beloved would one day reach out from beyond the grave. Finally, she announced to the radio audience listening, Houdini did not come through. My last hope is gone. I do not believe that Houdini can come back to me or to anyone. It is now my personal and positive belief that spirit communication in any form is impossible. I do not believe that ghosts or spirits exist. The Houdini shrine has burned for 10 years. I now, reverently, turn out the light. It is finished. Good night, Harry. Over the years, Bess herself had been contacted by numerous mediums who proclaimed to provide tidbits of potential messages none of which ever showed any potential, until one day, she was told of a man named Harry Ford. The tale of his alleged encounter with the specter of her husband's ghost chilled her to the bone. The man claimed to have been conducting an unrelated seance, when out of the blue, he was contacted by a shuffling woman. She was not familiar to him, but introduced herself as Cecilia, and that she was desperate for her son to know the words forgive. She was so taken that she reached out to him, Strange that the word forgive is the word Houdini awaited in vain all of his life. It was indeed the message for which he always secretly hoped, and if had been given to him while he was still alive, it would I know have changed the entire course of his life. But it came too late. Aside from this, there are one or two trivial inaccuracies. Houdini's mother called him Eric. There was nothing in the message which could be contradicted. 
I might also say that this is the first message, which I have received, which has an appearance of truth. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, a staunch believer and old friend, believed the message to be an outstanding case of accuracy. However, a year prior, Bess had told the Brooklyn Eagle that any messages would contain the word for still, the contact was enough to prompt Bess to keep in touch, and a year later, her persistence appeared to pay off when she was visited by Ford, who claimed that finally, he had been given the Houdini code. When Bess heard the message, the one only she would recognize, she wasted no time organizing a second seance with Ford. Spare no time or money to undo my attitude of doubt while on earth. Now that I have found my way back, I can come often, sweetheart. Give yourself to placing the truth before all those who have lost the faith and want to take hold again. Believe me, life is continuous. Tell the world there is no death. I will be close to you. I expect to use this instrument many times in the future. Tell the world, sweetheart, that Harry Houdini lives and will prove it a thousand times. She was so convinced in the message that she immediately released a signed statement. Regardless of any statements made to the contrary, I wish to declare that the message in its entirety and in the agreed upon sequence given to me by Arthur Ford is the correct message prearranged between Mr. Houdini and myself. Signed, Bess. Friends, however, were skeptical, convinced Ford was a fraud and that the code had inadvertently been revealed a year prior when a unique cipher used by them had been published in an unofficial biography. Soon enough, it wasn't just friends who were concerned, but the public. The headline of the New York Evening Graphic, Houdini message a big hoax, seance, prearranged by medium and widow. However, Ford's lawyer was able to provide three witnesses who all vouched that was in another part of town when his interview with reporter Rhea Jore occurred. Bess was so incensed that she wrote a letter to the New York Evening this letter is not for publicity. I do not need publicity. I want to let Houdini's old friends know that I did not betray his trust. I am writing this personal because I wish to tell you emphatically that I was no party to any fraud. Now regarding the seance, for two years I have been praying to receive the message from my husband. For two years every day I have received messages from all parts of the world. Had I wanted a publicity stunt, I could no doubt have chosen any of these sensational messages. When I repudiated these messages, no one said a word, excepting the writers who said I did not have the nerve to admit the truth. When the real message, the message that Houdini and I agreed upon, came to me and I accepted it as the truth, I was greeted with jeers. Why? Those who denounced the whole thing as a fraud claim that I had given Mr. Arthur Ford the message. If Mr. War Ford said this I brand him a liar, Mr. Ford has stoutly denied saying this ugly thing, and knowing the reporter as well as I do, I prefer to believe Mr. Ford. Others say the message has been common property and known to them for some time. Why do they tell me this now, when they know my heart was hungry for the true words from my husband? The many stories told about me, I have no way to tell the world the truth of or the untruth, for I have no paper at my beck and call. Everyone has a different opinion of how the message was obtained. With all these different tales, I would not even argue. However, when anyone accuses me of giving the words that my husband and I labored so long to convince ourselves of the truth of communication, then I will fight and fight until the breath leaves my body. If anyone claims I gave the code, I can only repeat they lie. Why should I want to cheat myself? I do not need publicity. I have no intention of going on the stage or, as some paper said, on a lecture tour. My husband made it possible for me to live in the greatest comfort. I do not need to earn money. I have gotten the message I have been waiting for from my husband. How, if not by spiritual aid, I do not know. And now, after I told the world that I have received the true message, everyone seems to have known of the code, yet never told me. They left it to Mr. Ford to tell me, and I am accused of giving the words. It is all so confusing. In conclusion, may I say that God and Houdini and I know that I did not betray my trust. For the rest of the world I really ought not to care a hang, but somehow I do. Therefore this letter. Forgive its length. Sincerely yours, Beatrice Houdini. Whether Bess and Ford fabricated the idea of Houdini escaping anything, even death to preserve his legacy, 
or if Ford did indeed receive word from the other side, remains a mystery. If Ford took advantage of a heartbroken widow and coerced the information he needed from her, he simply managed to validate the fraudsters whom Dini crusaded against. Either way, the tale of his ghost doesn't quite stop there. In a recording studio called The Mansion, with various musicians have reported weird sights and odd occurrences. It has been host to the likes of Mick Jagger, Jimi Hendrix, David Bowie, The Beatles, The Red Hot Chili Peppers, Slipknot, and Linkin Park, to name a few. There are definitely ghosts in the house, said Red Hot Chili Peppers guitarist John Frusciante. But they're friendly. The Houdini Mansion, as it's come to be known, in Laurel Canyon, is one of the most persistent urban legends in Hollywood, despite having something of a convoluted history. For a start, there is only circumstantial evidence that Houdini actually lived there. A fire raged through Laurel Canyon and burnt a number of houses, including one believed to be where the original ties to the property began. A property nearby was believed to be where the Houdinis would stay. The two properties were connected by underground tunnels, many suspect may have been used by Houdini to secretly move between the separate guest house and main mansion itself. The property actually belonged to a good friend, Ralph M. Walker. As a select few were privy to where the magician chose to lay his cuffs at the end of a taxing day, it's suspected he and his wife stayed with Walker while he worked on the films, The Grim Game and Terror Island, most likely in the guest house that ended up being engulfed in the fire. The main evidence to support this theory is the housing of a deep water tank, not your standard decor. Sightings of apparitions have been a frequent occurrence since the 70s. The man, generally presumed to be Houdini, wanders the grounds deep in thought. Chances are performed on a frequent basis in an attempt to make contact. Is it possible those tampering with the spirit world brought forth another poor soul? Mistaken for Houdini? Whatever. The real story is, it's clear these legends surrounding this Hollywood landmark just get bigger with time. Whilst the site itself seems to be a bed of activity, the jury remains out on the entity's true identity. Was this his final act of evidence against the spiritualism he challenged so much, or was it a genuine wish to prove a love that transcended life and death? Or was it nothing more than the final illusion from the master himself? What of the apparition that roams the property holding an unknown connection? Could it be Houdini, trying to fulfill his promise to Bess? Or could it be a simple case of Hollywood stories and falsehoods becoming legend and fact? Errol Leslie Thompson Flynn was an Australian actor who achieved worldwide fame during the golden age of Hollywood. He was known for his romantic swashbuckler roles, frequent partnerships with Olivia de Havilland, and reputation for his womanizing and hedonistic personal life. To celebrate his good fortune in Filmland, Flynn designed his dream house, a playhouse, he called it. He bought 11 and a half acres in the Hollywood Hills off Mulholland Drive and, in 1941, built the sprawling farmhouse. An unbroken line of windows provided a panoramic view of the city below. He called it Mulholland Farm. Flynn built Mulholland Farm with secret passages and peepholes, two-way mirrors in the bathrooms, and a crawl space above one bedroom that allowed him a full view of the bed. This was something of an open secret in Hollywood, and surely some of his guests took it on themselves to entertain their hope. But how many more toweled off in front of the mirror or stretched out on the bed, unaware of his invisible, peeping presence? The invisible, all-seeing, heavy-breathing spirit of the master of Mulholland Farm sounds like the plot of some bad horror movie. According to Insider, the owner of the house after Errol Flynn's death began to notice unusual things. In 1980, the singer-songwriter Ricky Nelson bought the property, and it wasn't long before he too began to feel weird and uncanny currents in the air at Mulholland Farm. The house was notorious for reasons more perverse than the odd drunken punch-up or harsh tongue lashing. Flynn was something of a satyr, with an insatiable appetite for women, even if they were underage and uninterested. Flynn has been described as wild and restless. Is it possible that the house he put his energy into building became exactly like its owner? All the heroes in one magnificent, sexy animal package, that's what Jack Warner called him, 
A scoundrel with an irresistible twinkle in his eye, Errol Flynn was what every woman wanted and what every man wanted to be. He was put on trial for murder, prone to violent outbursts, racist remarks, and accused of statutory rape, being a Nazi spy, and a sadist. He slapped a member of the press over an article involving his beloved dog in a tussle which resulted in him being stabbed in the ear with an oyster fork. That's just the stories that made it to press. By all accounts, Ricky Nelson loved living in Errol Flynn's home. The swashbuckling superstar had some high times in the Hollywood Hills, lots of wine, women, and song. Nelson was no slouch in that department either. The teen idol turned pop legend felt a strong kinship with the spirit of Flynn, and perhaps Flynn felt it too. His spirit, or someone's, may have even tried to warn Rick of his tragic fate. In 1959, 19-year-old Ricky Nelson was driving teenage girls crazy on both the big and small screen. He joined his parents and brother David on radio's The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet at age four. The show moved to television in 1952 and ran 14 years. During that time, the world watched Ricky transform from irksome teen to rock music idol. Eventually, he married and had his own family. In 1977, he found the perfect home for them. He bought the Flynn estate from country and Western artist Stuart Hamblin, the only other owner. Rick and his wife, actress Chris Nelson, moved into the Mulholland home with their four children just 18 years after Flynn's demise. In particular, Nelson's daughter, Tracy, would often feel a presence in the house when she was alone. The house was a two-story ranch house. It wasn't oversized or grandiose in any way, but it was sprawling, daughter Tracy said. The front door was in a place where it shouldn't have been, so we never used it. And because of that, I never really felt that the house had a heart, had a center. I would usually just come in and go straight up to my room. My bedroom used to be Beverly Odlands, and we used to always smell this funky perfume, a really cheap perfume. All sorts of weird things went on. My shower door would open and close in the middle of the night. The toilet would flush. My shades would roll up for no reason. The ghost in her room felt distinctly feminine. Ms. Odland is still living. Could it have been her mother? Instinctively, Tracy felt it was an older presence. This is gonna sound so crazy, but it didn't feel like a young, naive girl. It felt like a cynical presence. A cynical woman in Flynn's house? That could have been any number of women Flynn had loved and forfeited. Whoever or whatever was there, her friends felt it too. When I was going to school, Girls would have slumber parties, but nobody would stay at my house. To me, it was like having a pet, like, oh, well, it's just that weird energy in the house. Rick and Chris Nelson's home life did not quite mirror the happy family we saw on the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. The couple was plagued by problems, and in the early 80s, Chris moved out with the twin boys. The youngest son went to live with Chris' mother, whilst Tracy remained with her father. I was doing square pegs at the time. One night, I arrived home from work. It was dark. I looked up at the dining room and the light was on, and there was a man standing in the dining room. I thought, oh, Pop's home. I went upstairs and called him. No answer. His car's not there and there's nobody's there. Then the phone rang, and it's Pop calling from the road to say he'd be home tomorrow. Tracy told him what she'd just seen, and Rick replied, oh, that's just Errol. The following day, Tracy came home from work while it was still light out. She went straight to her room to read. After a few minutes, there was a noise from downstairs. It sounded like someone had broken in. My father had a room below mine full of his gold records and awards, all hanging on the walls. It sounded like whoever was down there was smashing all the gold records and all dad's stuff. And I remember thinking, oh my God, take anything, but don't take those. I hid myself in the closet and I waited for the noise to stop. It was really loud. The house was shaking. It sounded like people were throwing things against the walls, breaking chairs and breaking glass. The sun finally went down. It had been quiet for a while and I thought it was finally safe to go downstairs. Tracy expected to find the place in shambles, but there was no broken glass, no smashed furniture. Instead, all the lights had been turned on. Two pet cats were in Rick's bedroom, and the door had been locked from the inside. Nothing else in the house had been touched. Tracy decided then and there to move out. A short time later, 
After she'd moved into her own apartment, Rick and his girlfriend called her one night. The weirdest thing happened, they told her. We were downstairs and we heard all this noise coming from your room. We thought we were being robbed. Things were crashing and breaking. We called the police, ran outside down the driveway, and waited for them to come. When they got here, the couple continued, they went upstairs to investigate. Your door was locked from the inside. When they opened it, they discovered that all the lights in the room had been turned on, but not a thing had been touched. Ricky's theory? That's just Errol. He became so accustomed to the auditory spells that his reference to Flynn's ghost became almost casual, as if a friend had stopped by to cause carnage and left. The ghost allegedly appeared again when Nelson's son, Gunner, claimed to have caught a glimpse of Flynn sitting on the edge of his bed, according to author Robert Matson. Family guests saw him too, particularly in the wing of the house where Flynn kept his rooms. Children of friends would inexplicably avoid these areas, but could not articulate why. Gunner himself described the house as alive. If it were a person, it's not a good one. One night, Rick decided to throw a party. Tracy, already tired, decided to go upstairs to lie down. But once in the comfort of her bed, she suddenly feels like she can't move or breathe. Her efforts to get up, virtually dragging herself to the landing, cause her to fall down the stairs. When she gets to the bottom, all she can hear is laughter. This rings eerily similar to a tale from Flynn's earliest days. When Flynn decided that acting was his calling, he moved to Britain to get started. He soon began working and studying the craft, but just as it had at every school he attended, his time there came to a disturbing and sudden end. Just months after arriving, the company fired him after he got into a quarrel with a female stage manager and shoved her down a set of stairs, chuckling after. I've tried to figure it out, Tracy said. There was a lot of really wacky stuff going on in terms of drug usage in the house when I was growing up. I believe all that stuff creates energetic chaos. I don't know what else to call it. So it was a wacky place to live anyway. Then compound that with the history of the place. Tracy has a theory about the two explosive smashing episodes. Perhaps Flynn or the cynical woman were trying to warn Rick of impending tragedy. When the warnings failed and Rick was killed at age 45, before his time, like Errol, the spirit turned black. Rick Nelson's death occurred on New Year's Eve, chillingly seven years prior. When Tracy was sick one night, she awoke to hear something in another room. She went out to see what was going on and it was Errol Flynn as he was in his heyday. He was drinking and he toasted her Happy New Year and vanished. This did not happen on New Year's Eve. My father's dying was such a cataclysmic thing for the family. Maybe it was a warning. Maybe it was. Who knows? All the women on my mother's side are very psychic. My grandmother, my mom, myself. Since I was a kid, I've always been very open to the possibility of ghosts because I always kind of felt them. All I can tell you is that it was definitely haunted. Ricky died in 1985. Prior to his tragic death at the hands of a 1944 Douglas DC-3 that once belonged to Jerry Lee Lewis, his family report that he started to act increasingly strange. He began to dress only in his bathrobe, something he had rarely done. He also showed symptoms of depressive behavior. The house he loved began to decay around him, and it seems Rick mirrored it. He had for years loathed flying, but developed an obsession with planes, to the point he purchases one he believed to be the safest, and then ultimately dies in it. His sons, Matthew and Gunnar, were due to fly on that very same plane with their father, until he made a call to Gunnar the night before to ask him not to accompany him on the flight, but to instead fly commercial. This out-of-the-blue request to change plans initially confused his children, but now they wonder, did he have a foreboding sense of the danger? Rick Nelson lived in the Mulholland house until his death. Tracy recalls that the spirit in the house changed dramatically after that. It had been playful before, but after my father died, it turned malevolent. My brothers and I could literally feel when my father's presence was gone, and when he left, it just turned ugly and scary in the house. My now ex-husband always had a hard time believing any of this ghost stuff. After dad died, we were removing some furniture, and he went outside and refused to go back in. 
He told me, something's in that house, and I don't even want to be anywhere near it. Richard Dreyfus, Tracy's co-star in Down and Out in Beverly Hills, talked to her about buying the house, but Tracy warned him away. It's a bad house, and it's got something bad in it. The Mulholland house stood vacant after Rick Nelson's death. During that time, darkness seemed to completely envelop the place. A gang broke in and murdered a girl in the living room. It seems that although the ghosts of the Flynn house may have finally been laid to rest, her father's spirit still lingers. When Tracy was diagnosed with cancer and treated successfully, none of it may have been possible without an intervention from beyond the grave. She tells the story of her father coming to her in a dream. My father called me on the phone and said, I know you miss me, but it's not time for you to die. You have to go see a doctor. The house itself was torn down many years ago and the acreage divided up into separate lots, rebuilt on and subsequently sold 